Welcome back to the Bentonville Beacon Podcast. I'm James Bell, your host, and our guest today is Andrew Gibbs Dabney, the founder of Lives and Designs. Welcome to the show, Andrew. Yeah, thank you for having me. Hey, uh, let's start off by uh, tell us about yourself and your love for the outdoors, and uh, you know where did that come from? Man, that's a big question. So I've grown up in Arkansas pretty much my whole life. So I moved. My family moved here when I was two. We lived in Fayetteville. Um, as a kid, I was in Boy Scouts and went hunting and fishing and, and generally spent my time outdoors. If it wasn't on some sort of camping trip or hunting trip with my dad, it was being down at Wilson Park in Fayetteville and the creek building forts and just being outside generally <clears throat> all the time. You know, I was, I was close enough to the park where I was one of those kids where my parents could come outside and just yell when it was dinner time. And I'm like, that's my dad's voice, you know, or my mom's voice and <laughs> go back home. Um, so very early on, the, the the love for the outdoors was was the seed was planted, I guess you could say. And then as I uh, grew up and went through high school and into college, that interest really turned into um, to more of a passion. Um, I like to spend time camping a lot. Uh, started spending a lot of time uh, on local rivers, so the Mulberry, the Buffalo, doing lots of canoeing, uh, dabbled in climbing, but really got into mountain biking. Um, and along with just various other outdoors sports, you know, recreation, there's, there's almost nothing that I haven't at least tried. Um, and those are the things that, that motivate me to stay fit. They help me, they help keep me fit. You know, they inspire me to do more creative things. It, it, if I'm stressed out, I can get outside, right? Like it's, it's almost like a motivating factor and a rejuvenating factor and a, and a um, what's the word I'm looking for? Therapeutic. Um, factor to, to my experience with the outdoors. So it's just, it's a big part of me and it Wonderful. always has been, it feels like. Wonderful. Well, uh, tell us about Lives and Designs. Uh, how did you come to the place that you <clears throat> founded the company? Where did the name come from? Love to know more. Sure. Um, Lives and was really born out of this effort to simplify the things that I own. So at a certain point, I realized that, that, that owning lots and lots of, of just things comes with some sort of uh, tax on yourself, both emotionally and physically and, uh, mentally. And you just have to deal with, with, with things. Right. And, and, and when you deal with so much stuff, then you're not really having the experiences in your life because you're, you're managing things. Um, so I went on this effort to simplify things like, uh, <clears throat> like gear, outdoor gear, right? Like if you're, if you have the life, like I said, that I've kind of dabbled in everything, you end up with just bins and boxes and shelves full of full of things, bags and shoes and boots and hiking poles and t old tents. So you never want to get rid of anything, right? You always just feel like I need to keep it. Um, so I started going through this effort of simplifying things down to the one, you know, best version of these things and, and, and making my collection of, of belongings be this collection of high quality, very durable, very versatile things that I just, I love. And I want to spend the time taking care of and organizing and using, right? So that went into clothing. <clears throat> as I went through the clothing that I wore and had, um, I realized that there was a few pieces that I've, you know, have acquired along my life that I've just loved, right? Like they're, they've become more than just a shirt or a jacket. There was an emotional attachment to these things and there's things that I wanted to keep. There was also holes in the wardrobe that, um, didn't hit these qualities, right? There was things that I didn't own that I also couldn't find that had this mix of the ability to wear them every day to doing something like this, to um, being able to wear them hiking or outdoors or climbing and also just look normal, right? Um, and so my background after college was working in outdoor apparel. I was the uh, COO and then CEO of Fayette Chill Clothing Company out of Fayetteville. <clears throat> and so we worked in uh, lots of t-shirts and sweatshirts and things, but we also did full cut and sew design. So button downs and jackets and, and pants. And, and so I got to learn a lot about the supply chain, the operations, the branding, the management, the, you know, the, the people side of the business, and at least got to experiment with what to do and what not to do for several years. So when you combine this desire to own these uh, pieces that I could not find in the market with at least some experience to, you know, go past zero to step one. Um, that was the foundation for lives. And so it was this idea of building only products that need to exist 
only uh, things that hit these characteristics of durability, sustainability, versatility, right? Mm-hmm. And um, to answer the second part of your question, Livsen is the first part of a word in Swedish uh, pronounced lives and lives nutare, which phonetically is more like lives in jutare. And it means one who lives life fully into the extreme. Um, when I found this word, it motivated me because all these things that were in my head about this brand that was like, you're going to own things that facilitate this life of adventure that don't pull you down, that are very versatile. If you are this lives nutare, uh, you need these things around you. Like if you, if you are this person, if you're this person that wants to live this experience filled life, what are the things that you surround yourself with? What do you buy? What do you purchase? What do you wear? And I'd already been um, kind of percolating all these ideas about what the brand would be. And it, this crystallized it. Um, and I love the b- beginning of that, that lives in for lots of reasons. It was it, it rolled off the tongue in a very smooth way. It's like symmetrical. I don't know if you look at it written like the L and the N are kind of opposite um, and very equal it's short and it had this this quality that i like which is it's a little bit hard to say right and i've always been kind of a fan of brands like uh like 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 lacroix and like fial raven is an outdoor brand that like when you first look at it you're like lacroix and and then when you figure out it's lacroix it's like oh you kind of feel like you 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 learn something you're an insider knowledge and um kind of going down a rabbit hole here, but there was lots of things with lives in that stood out to me. Uh, it also has some puns like lives in, right? Like, so you, you this whole thing is kind of a Zen mind frame sure. or mindset. Um, and then lives in like you, he lives in his clothes, right? So like there was all the, you know, when the stars align like that around a brand or a name, you want to name your brand and the social accounts and the URLs aren't taken and the LLC is free, right? Like those are the things you're like, okay, I need to, need to go. Um, so that's pretty neat. I have, I feel like I have some insider knowledge now. I've, I've never heard that story about, uh, how your name, uh, came about. So turns out y'all have been pretty successful. You have had a couple of, uh, uh, I think, um, successes with Kickstarter. Can you tell us about that and how that works with outdoor apparel? Sure. So we weren't, there was some path laid forward on Kickstarter for brands like ours. There've been some, some successful campaigns in the outdoor apparel space and also specifically in pants. Um, and it was from, it was in the business plan from day one was to launch on crowdfunding. Um, the reason being really from a tactical point of view is you need to create a certain amount of an item to get it made in most factories. Right. So we had to hit a production minimum that was fairly high. Um, and to start out with these products that, we wanted to start out with. There's a traditional, a more easy, or not easy, but a more traditional path to apparel where you kind of start with t-shirts and branded hats and off the shelf clothing and you build your brand first and then you work your way to, you know, full mm-hmm. cut and sew designed products. Um, I didn't want to get stuck in that process. I wanted to start and launch the market with the products that we wanted to be known for, for the lifetime of the brand, which means we had to somehow you know, finance and produce and make a pretty high volume of products throughout the bat. So I saw Kickstarter as our best way to do that. Um, it, it, it's very cool. I, I, the whole crowdfunding philosophy I find pretty fascinating and, um, and motivating. So it's, it's very democratic, right? Like mm-hmm. it, in, and even from a sustainability point of view, if we were to go to Kickstarter with a product and didn't work, right? Like it didn't get funded, and we didn't make it. That's a pretty clear signal that no one really needed that, right? Like you shouldn't really make it. One of our core beliefs is that if you make something that just already exists or shouldn't get made in the first place, then it doesn't matter how green the product is, it's wasteful because it wasn't needed. No one needed it. And so Kickstarter seemed like this really excellent pat platform to one, get that volume we needed to produce, two, test our idea, see if we have product market fit. And then third, it's a, it's a customer acquisition channel, right? So it's a way to get your brand out there quickly, fast or fast and um, efficiently for the most part. What it's not is profitable. Um, So if there's any entrepreneurs listening to it, Kickstarter is is definitely a a tool and it's got a lot of great uh, things, but by the time you kind of run the campaign and spend the marketing and cut the fees out and do everything, it it ends up being, you know, usually a break even or or even going the other way. Um, So our Kickstarter, for what it's worth, our last several have have been on the, in the black, right? But our first one, we did $78,000 in sales from, I think, roughly 500 backers. Um, so those are 500 people that took a chance on a brand that they've never heard of, 
right? We have no history besides like a, you know, Instagram account that was six months old. Yeah, impressive. Um, thank you. And then we ended up doing a second campaign about a year later for version two of our pants. So the first one was pants and a fleece. We did two products. Um, the pants that were most known for the flex canvas pants were somewhat of a side project. We thought our fleece, the high wool fleece was going to be like the flagship product that we were known for. It had a lot of really cool material story, a lot of sustainability aspects. Um, but it turns out the pants that I kind of designed for myself because I couldn't find good kind of canvas, like kind of a more cotton based, heavy duty outdoor pant that didn't fit badly. Like that's where it all kind of came from. Um, outsold the fleece three to one. Um, we continued to outsell the fleece when we were out of pants, just pre-selling. And so we decided, uh, or we basically me at that point decided to do a second campaign for a version two of the pants. We were able to make them with organic cotton, uh, use recycled polyester, took a lot of the feedback from that original 600 that we made from that first campaign and implemented it into a version two. So fit pockets, placement, some roll up, system things, you know, just all these, you know, customer feedback and Kickstarter is this really cool environment. That's unlike anything else where people do it because they want to be part of your story. They're not passive for the most part. Like they want to buy it. And if you ask them what they think they're going to tell you, right. And if you don't ask them what they think they're going to tell you, which is an asset, right? So you can hear customer feedback very quickly. You can iterate very fast. And so we decided to stick with, instead of expanding out and going to a bunch of different apparel pieces in different categories, let's dig deep into this thing that's working. People like these pants and people kind of love these pants. Let's make them better and go back. So that one did about 105,000 for the second version. And then uh, almost two years later, we delayed it uh, for a few different times. We did our third campaign. That was in the beginning of 2021. And that one was a new pair of pants, the Ecotrex. So it was a new product for us. It was full synthetic. So um, had all the, um, where our first ones were more cotton based and heavy duty canvas. These are a little bit lighter, a little stretchier, a little more, they had water resistance, quick drying features. And the coolest thing was they're made from recycled ocean buoys. So they're fishing buoys that were recovered within a hundred miles of the mill, spun into new nylon and made into these pants. And that one seemed to have, uh, been kind of square peg, square hole uh, for the Kickstarter platform. So that did $500,000 or really 515. And between that and Indiegogo and add-ons, we did nearly $600,000 in pre-sales for that pant in 2021. So very successful. And, and it was uh, basically, I think it took us to a different level of uh, brand equity or notoriety, you know, no, you know, thing, what uh, the good things that come along with, with increased sales and exposure. You bet. That's really impressive. I mean, so it keeps getting better and better. I got to tell you, I bought my first pair of lives and pants uh, a few weeks ago at Moose Jaw, uh, and I am thrilled with them. I think I could wear them every day. I, I won't name the guy in town, but I do know a guy in town who says he has a pair of, of uh, lives and pants that he bought three years ago and that he's been wearing them for three years. That's pretty impressive. Mm -hmm. uh, but what's really impressive to me is, Obviously, they're durable. They're really comfortable. I've never had a pair of outdoor pants that I thought were actually comfortable until now. So yeah. well, thank you for making that. them. Yeah. So uh, what's your, do you have another crowdfunding campaign coming up? What's that going to be like? We do. Um, we, there's a product that actually, if you open up my sketchbook from the very beginning of Libsyn when I was designing products, the very first thing in there we haven't made, um, it was, it is a jacket. Um, it's not a traditional jacket, like a fleece or a rain shell that you'd find at a traditional, like a moose jaw. It's, it's different. It's, uh, we don't have a name for it yet. Um, but the predominant or the shell fabric is something called Ventile. And Ventile is this cotton fabric. It's 100% cotton. Um, it is waterproof and windproof and, uh, just extremely durable. And so cotton and waterproof typically aren't words that you hear together. Right. This is the only cotton that basically can make this claim. The story of it's very cool. It was actually um, developed by the Royal, by British intelligence for the Royal Air Force in 1943 to save pilots that were crashing into the English Channel. Basically, they were dying of hypothermia before the rescue boats could get to them, uh, you know, in the Battle of London for, in World War II. 
So they developed a cotton that was the longest staple cotton you could get. So the longest threads or longest actual cotton. Uh, I don't know what the word is, uh, but the longest cotton, you know, raw cotton, and then wove it so densely that it became waterproof. So think like a fire hose, you know, that, that kind yeah. of thing. Um, and then it's got a little bit, it's got a, a or it's a, a PFC free. So a more environmentally friendly DWR code on it, which DWR is durable water repellency. So it, mm-hmm. it lets it, the water kind of shed off, but even if it didn't have it, it would be hard to wet through. So it's this, it's this cotton shell. And then for the, the insulating layer is a wool. So it's wool insulation and it's not just wool, it's uh, traceable. So it's ethical wool mm-hmm. that you can actually trace through, uh, uh, the, the label you can look up and find out where the farm is that, you know, raised the sheep that this wool was, this wool came from. And so you can be sure that it wasn't, they weren't mistreated. Right. And then the liner itself is actually silk. So we got this really kind of heavy twill silk. And what I'm getting at is here is an all natural waterproof insulated wicking jacket. That's cool. Um, I'm excited about it. It's very expensive. So hence why we're going to Kickstarter, right? So Kickstarter always comes with a discount. You're the first backer, you get the biggest discount. You're the second, you know, tier backers, you get a little less, but still a discount and it kind of runs that way. And this is one that we absolutely could not finance on our own because the risk is so high and it doesn't fit into our, you know, current customer base and, you know, our retailer network, like a moose jaw would probably mm-hmm. um, have a hard time bringing it into their store because the price point would be higher than almost anything in there but it's such a cool piece. It does not exist in the whole world. We have the opportunity to make it and it, it, the samples and the production and prototypes that we have are amazing. So we decided that's going to be our next Kickstarter. The launch date is roughly this summer. We don't know exactly when it'll be. That's pretty neat. I can't wait to see that. Um, that is too cool. Um, so let's talk about why you're, in Bentonville, why not somewhere else? Maybe you can tell us, you know, why is Bentonville in Northwest Arkansas and the Ozark Mountains such a special place for you beyond that of course you grew up here? And what's the advantage of being here? Yeah. I think the advantage really of growing up here, which you didn't exactly ask, but the advantage of growing up here is having visibility of the area. Right. Um I've traveled um, pretty much all over the United States. I've lived in different areas. I've definitely uh, been in you know the Rockies and on Mountain West and all those areas. And I'm absolutely amazed at those landscapes. My, and growing up, I'd always say, I'm going to move out to Colorado one day. That may happen one day too, you know, like in the, va- in the near, in the past future, just to experience that mountain air, as, you know, for full time. But what Arkansas has, I think is something special. It's maybe less flashy, but it's not anything less uh, inspiring. So having grown up in the Ozarks and, and, and been through, you know, all these hills and these valleys and, and uh, hollows and um, seeing the bluffs and the rock formations and the creeks and the rivers, there's something special about this place. And I think it, there's, it, there's been something special about this place for, well, forever, right? So well, for as long as it's been the Ozarks. Um, but not many people know about it. That's changing fast. Mm. And, and, and honestly, as a result of the mountain biking scene that our, our, local notoriety on the general outdoors arena in the inner outdoors industry has risen substantially since I started lives in even because of what the efforts that this area and the families here have done um, to develop mountain biking. But what I'm getting at is it, it's beautiful. It's untapped. It's uncrowded, right? So you go to a lot of the most popular outdoor destinations that are traditionally on the cover of outside magazine, right? And you go there and you've gone there and you had the same thought as 4,000 other people that day. You can't find parking. You feel like you're at a theme park. The trails are six feet wide, right? Or 12 feet wide in some places. And it's really hard to find that, that solitude, that inspiration that you go to nature to find. In the Ozarks, you can, you can get out there and be alone in one hour, you know, well, in 30 minutes from where we are right now, right? And chances are you won't see anybody else for a while. And if you do, it's going to be, you know, that's okay. But like there's special places here and and I feel like a lot of it is not even what you see, right? Like a lot of like the, it's almost like a micro version of the Rocky Mountains. Like I said, it's not 14,000 feet tall, you know, we're 2,000 feet tall, but it's beautiful and it's special. And uh, one of the, taglines that we ran with for a long time at Fayette Chill is the Ozarks are magic. 
And I always really liked that. We had shirts that just said the Ozarks and Magic and they were really well, some of my favorite. Um, but that encapsulates this idea that like the Ozarks have something special, you know, and and, and there's something to be uh, gained by spending time outside here. And just to hit it more on the head of, of the interest of this podcast, whenever I was going to start lives in, um, I looked all over the country. We had kind of tabula rasa, right? We could have gone anywhere. Um, I have connections in other places, obviously not as deep here from, from growing up here, but I looked at, you know, uh, moving out to Utah, um, places in Colorado, Oregon, Northern California, places where there are hubs of outdoor industry that already exist, even North Carolina. And the thought was, you know, go where there's a hub, right? You can find talent, you can find capital, you can be, you know, at the bar rubbing shoulders with people that are going to be your, you know, partner later on. Mm -hmm. Um, but at the time we were doing that, there was rumors of things going on here, right? That we're seeing materialize today. There was the push towards mountain biking, which from my point of view was always going to open up the greater outdoor access and get people knowing what this place is because they'd come here for mountain biking and realize they can climb or float or hike or camp, right. you know, all these, these great things. Um, and, and knowing what I know about Arkansas combined with what it felt like was a regional current or, you know, canoe where everybody was paddling one direction downstream and that, and that direction was towards outdoor recreation. I thought it was a unique time to stay here. You know, I kind of wanted to go like, you know, I want, I've been here my whole life. But I don't wanted to go somewhere else, but it's like, well, or, you know, there's, there's this current, there's this, there's this, there's this, um, opportunity to be involved in something on the front side and be a brand associated with it and grow with an area that really wants to see things like what we're doing exist in this space. Right. And that's, that's unique. Um, whereas if we went to Denver, we would have been one of a hundred outdoor companies created that month. Right. Right. You know, here we, we get to be one of a handful and there are really good ones here. Right. And we get to be a, a, a voice in the conversation, help steer it and, and, you know, get the community support that, that is come that comes along with being part of something that the community wants to support. And that's beautiful. I, uh, growing up, spent a lot of time in sort of the North central, I'll call it ish part of the Ozarks. My, uh, uh, grandmother lived just South of, uh, Harrison, a little town, not mm -hmm. really in a town. It was a town between towns next to a town that nobody knew about. Uh, but a couple of miles from the Buffalo river. Yeah, it's beautiful just, country. It oh, is there. spent a lot of time on the uh, Buffalo river and, then I moved all over the country. In fact, I went to Denver. It's one of the places I went to. And even coming back to visit from a place like Denver, um, I remember one time flying into Springfield, Missouri, driving down to Fayetteville to meet up with my dad for a basketball game and realizing I left this place and that it was magic. It was absolutely beautiful. And every time I came back to visit, that was my observation. It's just mm -hmm. what a beautiful place this was and, and how – it was different, right? I mean, look, you go to these other places, I got to tell you, they're brown. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they're brown. That's their color. And you come here and it's green and it's lush and we have mountains and they're not as big, but it's just different. And it is, I think, magic. I think that's a great description of the first time I've really heard somebody uh, say that. So I appreciate you saying that. Yeah. There's a that brown thing. Like, you know, if you fly from here to California, right? Or you're coming back, rather. All you see is desert, right? right? You see desert and you see desert and you see desert and you see like a little bit of like evergreen, but it's still kind of deserty. Like it just feels dry. It feels like you're thirsty. Like you just want to pick up a water and drink something. And then all of a sudden, somewhere around Oklahoma, you start to see like grass and things shift to green. And by the time you're in Eastern Oklahoma and getting into Arkansas, it just turns into this like lush thing. And it looks like a place where life should be. Whereas sometimes you're flying over the desert, like you fly over Vegas and you're like, that doesn't look like there should be people being able to live there. Right. And there, and there shouldn't really, it's, it's supported by this massive infrastructure to keep water flowing. We don't have that issue here. And so if you look at it kind of from a meta perspective of where do you want to live, you want to live where it's hospitable, you know, habitable to live. Right. Um, and that's not exactly why we chose that, but I get reminded of it every time I fly back. I'm like, it just feels vibrant here. It does. It absolutely does. Um, and you've kind of touched on it some, but why should outdoor recreation 
businesses care about Bentonville and maybe take it further, you know, if they have a substantial presence elsewhere, maybe in, in the east and the Carolinas or out west in the Rockies, and even if they're not looking to relocate, why should they have some sort of presence here? Well, I mean, the low-hanging fruit is if anybody has anything to do with mountain biking or even, you know, broader cycling, they're, they're, there's obviously a business reason to be located or have some sort of satellite or presence or something here or do an event here. Do, you know, do something mm-hmm. because, you know, the, it, from the vantage point of someone who now lives in Bentonville um, and who has an office in Bentonville, you know, like I told you before, we went on a ride this afternoon from our office and went and rode. And in a traditional time when usually you think the trails would be nasty because it's been kind of raining and, mm-hmm. sn- you know, snowy and icy last week. We were actually able to get out and ride, you know, 11 miles and not hit mud because we stayed on some of the more flowy soil tack trails, which soil tack is this kind of uh, quasi concrete kind of softer, mm-hmm. um, which at first when I saw them doing that, some of these trails, I was like, why are we turning dirt trails into, you know, paved trails? And then I realized we have so many trails that the fact that they did that means that you can ride on a rainy day, right? And there's some parts of the world where, you know, ride in the rain anyway, but, you know, it's not good etiquette in some other places where the soil doesn't ha- stand up. So uh, I kind of diverge from the first question, but if there's mountain biking or, or cycling in the company's interest, there's definitely a reason to be here. The mountain biking capital of the world statement that was made or you claim um, is rapidly being followed up on. Right. And in, you know, whether you're cynical or you're optimistic, it's hard to look around if you ride bikes in this area and not think that there's something special and I think that the, the magic of that is access, right? Like from my house, I can access almost what, like 300, 400 miles of trail and not get in a car. From my office, I can do the same thing. Anywhere in Bentonville, you don't actually have to drive anywhere. You don't have to, you don't have to even have a bike rack if you don't want to, which, you know, most, there's very few mountain biking destinations that have that much trail network w- where people live. So anyway, off mountain biking, the broader outdoors, I think there's something to be said by showing, and this is this kind of is a, in a in a wrapped in a a bow of uh, media production, right? If all you're doing is showing, you know, Rocky Mountains and Pacific Northwest, in those topographies, your brand's going to resonate with people that, you know, are, are are interested in those topographies, right? There's a whole huge part of the outdoor industry that lives in the Midwest, the South, the Southeast, the Northwest, right? That resonate to more of a deciduous forest like we have, like, you know, uh, uh, where it's not all evergreens, where you, where it does, you lose leaves in the wintertime, right? Um, you, you get lusciously green in the spring and you show a topography and a, and a you know, group of people that don't, doesn't look exactly the same as everything you show all the time. Um, the outdoor industry, like when it comes to like specialty retail, so like, your special, like, you know, your, your outdoor outfitter retailer, mm-hmm. like a pack rat here in Fayetteville or down in Fayetteville. Um, they're clustered in the South and Southeast. They don't exist as much out West. Mm-hmm. And there's a, it's called the, you know, basically the REI effect. You know, it's almost like what, what um, people say about other major retailers back in the day, but REI has come in and, you know, knocked out a lot of the mom and pop shops in the small outfitters. The outdoor industry is thriving in the Southeast, right? So, and, and a lot of these brands do most of their sales here. But the representation of the of the in that sense, like it's not like it's like equity or inclusion or something. Like that, but the representation of the topography and the things that you see in the media is mostly just Rocky Mountains, you know, or Pacific Northwest, Northern California, and there's an opportunity to come here and, and get some more uh, diverse uh, landscapes. It's interesting that in this case, diversity is really what most of the rest of the country actually looks like and is right. Yeah. It's um, kind of silly to talk about diversity when it comes to landscapes, but it does, there's obviously no, a bigger I, conversation there, but it's just, you know, it, it comes to mind when you're thinking of why I come here as an outdoor brand a little bit, you know? Yeah. I had not thought of it in in that light before, but you're, you're absolutely right. Um, so if I were uh, in, I gotta tell you, I, I heard quite a bit earlier that, uh, you know, if, if you're an entrepreneur, you need to roll back to some of those discussions about uh, Kickstarter and the lead up to it and proving out the, the, the case before you spend a bunch of money. Um, but, you know, beyond that, if you were an aspiring outdoor recpreneur, so to speak, uh, what's the number one piece of advice? If, if I was, what was the number one piece of advice that you would give me? 
when I saw that question in the notes when you sent it before, I thought you had a typo. Yeah, I looked at it for a second and I realized that you invented a word. Um, so <laughs> outdoor rec recreppreneur. Um, it's hard to boil down anything for, for one piece of advice, you know, selfishly or maybe not selfishly uh, uh, from a sustainability point of view, I would ask that anybody thinking of creating a new product question whether or not that product needs to be created, right? Like that's the biggest thing that the outdoor industry is coming around to in a big way, but the greater just business community of the world is is not wanting to accept is that our waste issue and sustainability and pollution issues aren't generated by using ver like it's not what things are made out of i fully support using a sustainable material all of our things are recycled or organic or otherwise sustainable but it doesn't matter what how clean you make it if it didn't need to be made in the first place so that's like you go to outdoor retail or the big trade show every year there's 20 or 30 brands that popped up overnight and they have a rack with a hundred designs on it, right? And I say designs, they have a hundred products that were chosen from a manufacturer out of a showroom and they brought their woven label and say, can you put this on that? And they're trying to create a brand, right? What I'm, and, and it'll say that this brand is dedicated to sustainability and you know, all these issues, right? And it's like, well, how sustainable is it if you aren't making anything unique? 50 other brands have that same jacket. Right. And I, I say that knowing that it puts a target on our back, right. That says, yeah, there's pants that exist. And so the bar that I'm trying to set for entrepreneurs is not that you have to reinvent the wheel. It's just that you have something unique to say that can be when it comes to clothing, it can be fit, it can be colors, it can be materials, it can be something, right. But something that motivates you and gets people excited about your brand that makes it a little bit different. It's not, we're not saying you, no one get into this, right? It's just, you know, try a little harder. And from what I see from the brands that are here, most of the brands in the outdoor space that are actually driven by entrepreneurs that are passionate, that that is the case. It's just not always the case. That is, that is sage advice. I, I love it. Um, what's next for Livzen? Um, we feel like we have a lot of, of blue sky. Um, our goal uh, strategically is to be the number one bottoms brand in the outdoor industry in five years, right? So um, we, like I said, we're making a jacket, we're making other things, but we are really focused on this category of below the waist. There is an opportunity in our, in our space to fill some vacancies from brands that are receding uh, to do things better than brands that are leading. And we are already well on our way to that goal. Um, so we're going to stay laser focused on our core business, which is going to be pants and shorts and, and things below the waist, um, and try to take that number one spot and be that number one spot. Uh, that's like the business side of it from the, uh, social or thoughtful side of it. We are looking to be a leader in this conversation around sustainability and push this message that we just kind of talked about as hard as we possibly can, um, in the hopes of following somewhat in the footsteps, and, and I say this with, with like basically like all due respect, you know, to, to Yvonne Chenard from Patagonia, like we want to, that's not who I'm not trying to be Yvonne, but we're trying to basically follow in his footsteps, right? Like he's blazed that path and they've blazed that path of being a leader in a conversation around sustainability. And not only that, putting their money where their mouth is, we're doing things fundamentally different from a business perspective. We're doing things as a business that came up in 2022 you know, in the way you have to kind of survive, but we want to push this conversation around sustainability uh, and focus it on durability and end of life ownership of clothing and recycling and repairing and, and all these things that, you know, if we're going to make something new, we're going to try to do everything we can to keep it out of the landfill too. And Very we're not nice. alone in that. We're not, but we just want to be part, we want to be a, a leader in that conversation, not the leader, but just a big part of it. Very nice. Um, what's the, what should I have asked you that I didn't? <laughs> you know, that's the one question that I didn't actually have a, a, a thought in my head. I figured we'd, we'd cover a lot of it, and I think we have. Um, we're excited about this year. Um, we're excited about uh, building in in Bentonville in Northwest Arkansas. Um, we didn't talk about it, but our team in the last in the last one year has grown from just me to five. Nice. Full time. Um, we are excited about the prospect of continuing to recruit. Almost actually every single one of those people came from Arkansas. 
we've done a nationwide search every time. Nationwide job postings, we've had 80 to 150 applicants for every job we've posted. We've ended up hiring someone locally each time because the best person for that job happened to be here. And so we're not that deep yet. And I hope things like the GORP, you know, rec, you know the uh, uh, Greenhouse Outdoor Program for U of A and the other outdoor brands that are coming here kind of fill up our depth chart of talent. Um, but I'm excited to continue to explore opportunities with people that are local to build our team. Um, I'm excited. We have another crowdfunding initiative that's not product-based coming up soon. I don't think I'm legally allowed to say anything about it yet uh, because it gets into SEC rules and, and, and stuff like that. But there's, there's more for crowdfunding for lives in coming soon that I, I would, you know, when the time comes to talk about that publicly, we're, we're going to try to get that out into the local community pretty hard. So. Wonderful. Okay. I have to ask a follow-up question now. Uh, you mentioned that, uh, every time you did a national search, you ended up hiring, uh, folks local to Arkansas uh, because they were the most qualified for the job. Is that, does that have anything to do with the environment of the ecosystem that we live in where the largest world's largest company happens to have a headquarters here? So you have those sorts of employees and skills and backgrounds or are other local fortune five hundreds or is there something else there? Not, not a single one of those people was associated with fortune one. Interesting. So uh, there were applicants from that, that talent pool, right? Um, the people that we've hired so far have been associated with other small or startup outdoor associated brands. And that's who I was, that's why I was interested in them. Right. And, and they had experience in their space working in our industry in this area. Right. Which is a unique mix. And that's why I said that that depth chart's not super big now, but it is growing. Um, and several of like, you know, our, our, our head of growth now who does all of our digital ma- our advertising, all of our tech, stuff um was he I, was I hired his firm he uh has his own you know his own consulting firm that did digital advertising we were working with him for a year and i kept asking like we, we need you full-time he's like nah i got my firm it's growing i need you full-time nah it's just not a very good time you not not a good time i was like we need you full-time what's it gonna take fourth time he said okay let's do it i'm like he'd seen the proof in the pudding from working on our advertising to come in and and do that. So he's now uh, full time. Our, our our head of brand mar- our brand marketing manager was working for a, a local um, business in the outdoor in the mountain biking space, just doing amazing work on social media and storytelling and visual design and all these things. And uh, and you know she was, she was someone I knew and I saw her doing this amazing work and I said, hey, is this a possibility? And it was. Um, so some of it was recruited. Um, that was the same time as doing the big job posting. The other person for her job in particular was uh at at columbia sportswear is mm-hmm. one of their like basically top people that was doing this and she was actually interested in moving from there to here which was and it wasn't a it wasn't a no but we found this person locally that was just great um so it's kind of a long way to answer your question these people had a unique mix of background doing the things that we needed for companies similar to ours and they weren't associated with uh the big name interesting okay Okay, I'm going to throw one more question at you that I I didn't give you any prep for at all. This is totally out of left field. If you had um, one superpower, if you had a superpower, there's a twist to this, what would it be? And the twist is it has to have a limitation. For example, my superpower uh, would be that if I was watching a football game on TV, I could press the remote and it would transport me into that game, but it could only be limited to Arkansas Razorback games. I can only, I, I'm trying to think of a more appropriate one. I've answered this question before without that second part multiple times. And it's the only thing it's like when you have something in your head, you can't get it out. Um, and we're, we're on a podcast. I'm going to go ahead and say it. Uh, it's a little bit weird. Um, I've always thought that a very useful, weird superpower that isn't like flying or whatever, like, you know, obviously there's some, like, I would love to fly, right? Um, And do these things. (laughs) But I've always, I thought the most amusing and and potentially useful superpower would be able to transfer your need to go to the bathroom (laughs) to anybody you wanted to. Your limitation would be that they have to be within eyesight. So like, you, you know, think about a situation for this. Like you're going to get a job 
and there's like 50 people in there and you know this guy's a badass and he's gonna get it and so you just drink water the whole time and you have to pee and then right when he's about to go in there you wait till he's like 10 minutes in and then you're like you look through the window and you're like you you gotta pee now and you just transfer all that you're now fine and he's got to get up and go and have an emergency in the bathroom this might be the best one I've heard yet. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I had something else to say. I've just, I've thought about that since I was like 12 years old for some reason. I don't know why. And it, it's the all, it's all that was swimming around in my head when he asked that question. So, Hey, Andrew, thank you again for joining the show today. Really appreciate it. Uh, enjoyed hearing uh, your, your advice for entrepreneurs or outdoor recpreneurs <laughs> and hearing about lives in and, um, you know, really your uh, background here in Bentonville and Northwest Arkansas. And uh, to our viewers, hey, come back next week, hear more about Bentonville's businesses and Bentonville and Northwest Arkansas and why this is a place where you can have more of what you want, less of what you don't. See you next time.